my very respected and dear uh, Professor Dr. Matthew Koshi, the director, Eco Concerns, CSA Senate, and my dear brothers and sisters. I, at the outset, I want to thank Professor Koshi for uh, kindly inviting me to share some thoughts in this class. I also greet all of you. And today, I will be sharing some of the insights contributed by the following persons. Yeah, Terence E. Fratim. He has written on the theme, on the theme, the Earth Story in Jeremiah 12. And then Shirley West, she has written Retrieving Earth's Voice in Jeremiah, the annotated voicing of Jeremiah 4. And then Kalinda Rose Stevenson, If Earth Could Speak the case of mountains against Yahweh in Ezekiel. After three, Karen Prati, what he a professor of uh, Old Testament, and he has served widely in uh, America and sometimes in England. I think. He is known for his uh, books and writings far and wide. Uh, Kelinda was a, a writer. Uh, she has published many books and she was the award winner for publishing one of the eco books, but she is not technically a biblical person. The same way, Shirley Worst, she is also uh, from Australia and uh, she has contributed in theological writing, but uh, she did not serve in any theological faculty, but they were great writers. So it is very worthwhile to share some of the insights which comes from them. So you, I will take first Terence Pratim and the Earth story as presented in Jeremiah 12.1. And in his uh, writing, there are three sections. The first section is about the genre and structure behind Jeremiah 12. And second section, he writes the story within the context of the whole book because that is very important. Unless we get a feel about the book, we may not be able to understand what is in 12th chapter. Third section, it is focusing on the place of the earth in Jeremiah 12. That is very sharp. Earth reading in Jeremiah 12. And here, the author has used the principles of interconnectedness, the principle of voice, the principle of purpose and resistance. I think you were introduced about uh, the dominant principles of hermeneutics in earth reading of the Bible. So in this uh, section, the author uses three methods. I will try to show where it comes the principles of interconnectedness, the principles of the voice, the voice of the earth, the principles of the purpose and resistance. So this is very beautiful. And uh, I thought that before I begin to share about the Jeremiah 12, we should have a feel about the text. What is there in Jeremiah 12? Uh, it's, even though it is a short chapter, I will not read the whole chapter, but I will read a few verses, which is the voice of the earth. And then we know how to understand these verses through this lecture. Uh, chapter 12, verse 1, 
the prophet is asking God, why does the way of the guilty prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? You plant them, God, you plant them, and they take root. They grow and bring forth fruit. See, Jeremiah is asking, why bad people, why evil people are flourishing in this land? Are you not planting and they are thriving? And then he's asking in verse 4, because of these people, how long will the land mound? The grass of every field wither. The wickedness of those who live in it. The animals and the birds are swept away. This is the ecological consequence. The land is mowing. The grass is withering. Animals and birds are swept away because of these bad people. And then, verse 6, it says, even your kinsfolk, your own family, even they have dealt treacherously with you. They are in full cry after you. Here, God says, Jeremiah, you are asking about bad people, bad people in Israel, bad people in the world. But do you not, do you know that your own family, your own relatives are not loving you? They are against you. Do you know that? God is asking. And then he comes to the ecological thing. Is the hyena greedy for my heritage? Are the birds of prey all around her? Go, assemble all the wild animals. Bring them to devour her. He's calling all the animals to come and destroy the land, the land of Israel. And then he said, many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. God is saying, people have destroyed my country. My land, they have trampled down my portion. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it a desolation, desolate. It mounts to me, the land mounts to me. The whole land is made desolate, but no one lays it to heart. And then verse 13, they have sown wheat and they have reaped thorns. They have uh, Tired themselves, but profit nothing. They shall be ashamed of their harvest because of the fierce anger of the Lord. And these are some of the verses. Um, yeah. So now I will introduce. You know that this Jeremiah 12 is full of metaphors full of symbolic names and it is very much speaking about nature, trees, forest, land, earth. That is why we are going to read this chapter in the perspectives of the earth. So first I will introduce about 12th chapter. Some people say this 12th chapter is not a unit, but you have to start from 11th chapter. 11 and 12 can make a unit. And it is part of the confessions of Jeremiah. And there are about uh, four uh, confessions of uh, Jeremiah in the book. And this is one of the confessions of Jeremiah. Confessions of Jeremiah means, it is a technical term, lamentations of Jeremiah. There are four places Jeremiah is lamenting. So let us consider chapter 12, verses 1 to 18, the whole chapter, as a unit within itself. It helps. And then the Jeremiah 12 consists of two parts. First four verses, it is the lament of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is asking some questions to God. 
and 12, 5 to 17, it is the divine response. It is God's reply to Jeremiah. So you please keep it in your mind. First part is Jeremiah's question. Second part is God's answer. Jeremiah brings his lament to a climax in 12.4. First four verses are lament, and fourth verse, it is the climax. And it is not a concern about him. He begins with him. What happens to me? Uh, people are like this. Uh, but when it comes to fourth chapter, it is about the land. It is about its creatures. Now Jeremiah is asking, see, there are so many bad people. What will happen to the land? What will happen to its creatures? So this is the climax of the first four verses. Of course, God does not respond simply to the questions of Jeremiah's personal life. Jeremiah is asking what happens when bad people are happening. God is answering to that also. But apart from that, God also engages with Jeremiah for his concern with the land. So from verses 7 to 13, it is about the land and the future of the land. You mean if, you, if it is land, you must understand it is about Israel. It is about Judah. It is about Jerusalem. That land is very precious. So we should also imagine that in this chapter, it is speaking about that land in Israel. And now, yeah. First, God says, uh, say bad people are good, uh, good people are uh, suffering. He's saying, if you have raised with the putrunas and they have wearied you, how will you compete with the horses? This is a small problem, Jeremiah. The question you are asking, like you are running with people who are running on the foot, but you have to compete with the people who are racing with the horses. How will you manage? This is what. And if in a safe lane, land you are fallen down, how will you fare in the thickets of Jordan? Ordinary land you are not able to manage. But how will you manage in the thick forest? That means you have to raise your thoughts, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, you are very, very mediocre. You are thinking in an ordinary way, but you are a prophet. You have to speak for the nations. So why don't you lift your thoughts? What you are asking is too basic for me to answer. And now, from the perspectives of the vocabulary, I will bring you some of the things. Chapter 12, in verse 4 and verse 11, the concern for a land that mounts. Have you heard about that? Land mounting, land making racing voice. And then chapter 12, verse 7 to 19, 14 to 15, it is for the land as a heritage. I will explain this later. later. So first it is about the land as one which mounts. Please keep it in your mind. The second point, the land as a heritage, Nahala, as an inheritance. So there are two dimensions to land in chapter 12. And then it says, the lament in Jeremiah 11 to 20, intensify the laments in the beginning of the chapters. Say from 11 to 20, it is full of lamenting. I think you will understand the word lament. Lament means raising the cry, raising the pain. So Jeremiah, because it is full of lament, that is why they thought even the next book, the book of lamentations, it was written by Jeremiah. 
That is why it is coming after the book of Jeremiah in our Bible. <clears throat> and this 11 to 20, the intensity gradually increases and it comes to heavy intensity in chapter 20, verses 14 to 18. So you note down this verse. Later you can read in chapter 20, verses 14 to 18, you get into the depth of the laments of the prophet Jeremiah. And whenever a reader might think of the harshness and the indictments rendered against Israel, the violence of the judgment, the backdrop of these tumultuous and devastating events for God, Jeremiah, and the land is weeping and moaning. Once again, I want to say the Jeremiah text is very violent, very harsh, very fearsome. It looks like that, but in the backdrop of this, we must never forget, it is the weeping and moaning of God, Jeremiah, and the land. All the three are weeping. All the three are moaning. Their uh, voice is very interspersed. When Jeremiah speaks, sometimes it is God speaking through Jeremiah. When Jeremiah is speaking, sometimes land is speaking through Jeremiah. All the voices are coming. The book of Jeremiah is filled with tears. And Jeremiah's confessions or laments, it has produced so much of research materials. How they are to be interpreted is debated. Plenty of researches. Everyone proposes new method to understand Jeremiah's lamentations because it is so rich in meaning. And in Jeremiah 12, we are dealing with one such lamentation song, one such confession song. The content and the form in Jeremiah 12, it is almost similar to the laments in Psalms. For example, if you read Psalm 13, verse 1 to 6, you will see that the laments, the confessions of Psalm, the laments in Jeremiah are very similar in genre, in their structure. But do they voice the laments of the prophet, the community, or God? So the question for us, is it the lament of the prophet? Is it the lament of the community? Or is it the lament of God? All the three are there. So we have to be careful to watch this. They have become something, yeah, more than in the canonical process. Readers hear not only the voice of the prophet, but also the voice of God. Say, initially God spoke. Initially Jeremiah spoke. Then it became canon. Then it became sacred literature. But now it is more than that. God is speaking. Jeremiah is speaking. Their voices are there. When one considers the prophet's laments alongside divine laments, one can see that the prophet not only mirrors the lament of God, but actually he incarnates the divine word. Because we have to tell it in the beginning, we cannot read it like a beautiful literature. We cannot read it like a beautiful piece of aesthetic writing. But this is divine word. This is divine word incarnated by Jeremiah. So that also you keep it in your mind. Uh, Jeremiah 12 makes little effort 
to distinguish between the prophet's word and God's word. Their voice tend to bleed into one another. It is actually bleeding words, full of pain. And in the lamenting in this chapter, the focus is on the land. The whole focus is on the land. In Jeremiah 12, the land joins them in one grand liturgy of mourning. This is a liturgy, Jeremiah 12. It is a liturgy of mourning. Say when somebody passes away in our church, we have a liturgy. It is a liturgy of mourning. Same way, Jeremiah 12 is a liturgy of mourning, the mourning of the land. So now I think I have a little bit introduced about the basic structure, the basic form, what kind of literature, how should we understand what is behind these words, texture, vocabulary, all these things I have tried to introduce. Almost now it is in your mind. You can grasp what is in Jeremiah 12. Now I will take the second point. Jeremiah 12, in the context of the whole book, I think there are six or seven points in the second section. I have a simplified for you. So if you can uh, conceptualize these seven points, you can very easily comprehend the second section of this uh, study. Uh, first, it says, God made the earth. Will you remember that? This is the first topic in this section, uh, in Jeremiah. God made the earth. That comes from the beginning to the end. It is coming again and again in Jeremiah. If you want, I can say some verses. Jeremiah 33, 2. Uh, Jeremiah 10, 12 to 13, 51. Jeremiah 15 uh, to 16. Jeremiah 27.5, Jeremiah 32.17, just to mention, uh, you can see later. All these places mention that God made the earth. And then God continues to uphold the creation. That is also very important. It says God made the earth and God upholds the creation. Creation means sea, sun, moon, stars, day, night. Everything is part of this creation. And it is not a mechanistic world. It is not a divinely determined one, but the land, the creation, is full of feelings. It is not something just uh, like a mission. Now I will show you some of the verses. The land can become desolate and mound. This is one verse. The land has feelings. And then the animals and the birds can be swept away. 12.4. The human behaviors can bring havoc in God's good creation, 12.1. Our actions can affect the good creation. God does not control or manage the world. God is not controlling. This entails an openness for a genuinely creaturely decision-making. Human beings can decide. Nature can decide. God will not control. The people are given choices that will shape their future, also that will shape the future of other creatures. Human beings, their actions, it will have consequence. 
it will shape their future what we are doing in this century will be consequence for the next century what decisions we are taking in politics economy science nature ecology the consequence is going to be met by our children and our great grandchildren that is that not only our generation the consequence will be met by earth by the land by the mountains by the sea so this is how god has created our earth and now it says even figuratively human beings are also like one of the plants in the nature we are also like plants what a beautiful verse i will read mm, yeah uh verse two, chapter 12 verse 22 god plants the people and the people who take root grow and bring forth fruit so in god's view we are also looking like a plant god is planting us and we take root we grow and we give fruit and then it says and the creatures grow up into and the fruit they bear what kind of fruit we bear that will make a difference and it will make a difference for ourselves and also for the world either for good or for ill and it says people can make god's pleasant portion into a desolate wilderness if we are bad god's good vineyard fertile vineyard can become wilderness 12 10 and the god who is near and far can be far from our hearts that is 12 2 this god is very near to us at the same time this god is very far away in heaven god is a combination of near and far but what we do we do not keep god near to us we have destroyed that dimension and we want to keep god far away from our hearts if we keep then our activities will be bad if we are good god will be close to us and when we are bad god is punishing israel by the babylonians and the babylonians are coming with huge army and they are thrashing on the land with their military boots and they are not walking softly on the land on the agricultural land in the beautiful city zion they are like rowdy rogues they are coming with big boots and they are trampling they are placing their foot violently in their uh, and they devastate the land they devastate the people this is war scene jeremiah is writing at the time when babylonia invaded jerusalem that is why he mentions about babylonian army that is coming in chapter 12 verse 14 and then yeah <clears throat> so first section we have seen that god has created this earth and this earth belongs to god that is what we have seen and earth has feelings and we are also like a plant in this earth and the human actions have consequence for what god has created second section god fills the heaven and the earth this is uh, very important god gave you a blessing you multiply and fill the earth that was a great blessing and that blessing helped that this earth is filled with all kinds of creatures hence all creatures are 
in heaven and the earth, and they are other to God. Even though God created, God is the creator, we are the creation. Heaven and earth is the creation. So for creator, creation is other. For the creation, creator is the other. And there is a divine relationship between the creation and the creator. And that is why God is uh, described as God of all flesh. This is not only human beings. This includes entire living beings from amoeba to homo sapiens. Entire life. So God fills the whole year heaven with living things. And then when God fills, sometimes the land can mount. That means it has a relationship with God. Land has a relationship with God. Land can relate with God independent of human beings. God also can address land without human beings. So this is very, very important in Jeremiah. God fills the earth. God fills the heaven, the hosts of heaven. And they have a relation, the land, the trees, the animals, the birds. And human does not have to mediate. God has direct relationship with the land. Land and nature has direct relationship with God. This is one thing we have to recognize. And then the third point, a relational God creates a relational world. This is very important. When God is a God of relation, and when he created the earth, when he filled the earth, he created it with relationship. Every organism is related. Every living things are related. That is why the amoeba in Arctic or Antarctic flutters, there will be a consequence in Africa. There will be a consequence in Asia. They are so related. Actually, it is not simply the moral order that affects the creation, but uh, it is also the human sin which can have an adverse effect on the earth. This is uh, another kind of relation. The way we relate with the earth can have effects on the earth, relation. If we are good with the earth, then it is good. If we are sinners, then the effect will be very bad. For example, it says, because of the human wickedness, it does not rain. There is a verse in Jeremiah 3.3, 14.4. 3, uh, so this is the relation between human and the earth. If we are wicked in our business, then it will not rain in the earth. Also, it says that the animals and the birds will be swept away if we are not good. The land will be polluted if we are not good. The land will moan if we are not good. The entire earth, heavens, seem to be reduced to a pre-creation stage. Say before creation, it was void. It was empty. If we commit sin, now the earth is filled. The earth is orderly. It may go back reverse to pre-creation days. Then the fourth point, Jeremiah's God is not aloof. Jeremiah's God 
is not keeping away but jeremiah's god can be affected profoundly affected by our activity god manifests not only in sorrow god can also manifest in anger there can be two expressions one time when we are sinners god can become very sad for example jeremiah 12 seventh verse and sometimes god can become very angry 12th chapter 12th verse and uh, in the midst of this language of closeness and possession there is a strong expression of hate that is also in one way god uh, speaks that is very close to us in one sense god speaks that he is possessing us as his children but there is also sometimes fierce anger we are shocked to see the anger of god in Je- jeremiah 12 verse 8 you will see an angry god god is expressing hate the sharp juxtaposition of love hate language indicates something of the trauma of the broken relationship between god and creation say sometimes god is very loving sometimes god is very sad sometimes god is very angry why because god is affected by us god when god is affected by us there is trauma in god god has emotions god has emotions of great intensity and the god's heart is affected god's soul is affected so ah uh, say in jeremiah 4 23 it says i looked on the earth it was waste and void the birds and the air of the air fled the fruitful land was a desert before the lord before his fierce anger that is what he say the land is made desolate and produce thorns instead of wheat the sword of the lord the fierce anger of the lord anger is a divine response the sin is the reason for god's anger there is a dominant metaphor of mar- marital relationship between god and israel a deep intimacy between god and his people then the anger mixed with other emotions because god's spouse became harlot god's wife became unfaithful god's wife went after other husbands any husband cannot tolerate so like a husband who becomes angry for the infidelity of his wife god of israel becomes angry for his people in israel fifth one sin and judgment in jeremiah god brings disaster evil brings evil the consequence grows out of the deed only whatever we do we will get as a consequence and sometimes there is a beautiful verse in 2114 god visited i will punish you according to the fruit of your doing and there is another but i will visit upon you for the fruit of your doings and uh, to let evil and its effect go unchecked to provide a positive future for the land god uses another strategy god involves deeply into the realities of the 
sin of human beings and then god's way of working in the world that is the sixth one god works by bringing enemies by bringing his food uh, he brings nebuchadnezzar that is god's judgment he can bring cyrus that is to deliver god's people sometimes he will not pity not spare or not have compassion in the destruction of people in the destruction of jerusalem and even when god allows nebuchadnezzar to come and destroy jerusalem as his servant when nebuchadnezzar exceeds his limit god will punish nebuchadnezzar and many times a servant language is used in jeremiah for the birds animals in jeremiah god is using animals and birds as a media as his instruments to bring judgment upon israel so these points will give you a background how to understand the relationship of creator creation the things filled in the creation the activities of human beings the consequence of human beings and god sometimes is sad sometimes god is angry god sometimes brings punishment sometimes god delivers his people god is like a husband god is worried like a husband for the infidelity of his wife and it is like a marital metaphor and god is not keeping aloof god is actively involved in the creation but god does not control the creation god allows the decision making of the creatures and god helps us to overcome our shortcomings god brings punishment to allow the world to come back to correct paths and now we will come to the third section retelling the earth story in jeremiah 12 you are muted muted yeah yeah now am i audible yes i ah, yes. so we are coming to the final section in this uh, essay and now he is telling the earth story in jeremiah 12 it is a very beautiful passage uh earth you know how it is speaking it is speaking in the voice of jeremiah and here yes he is speaking to the creator so we will pick out the earth's voice uh god's response to jeremiah that is 5 to 17 initially addresses jeremiah's personal question why bad people are suffering and the good people like me are suffering 7 to 17 god speaks about what is happening to the land <clears throat> now god says the land on which god planted these people was a bountiful land and the land has a life giving capacity and even to the wicked people the land provides to take root and thrive and in another place it says it rains on the just and the unjust nature does not does not show any partiality but the hearts of the guilty and the treacherous unlike jeremiah's heart they are bearing fruits of wickedness and one such fruit it is the devastation for the land and this is a virtual refrain in jeremiah the land is not the problem but in the wake of their wickedness the land has been reduced 
to a veritable dust bowl. When the land is punished for the sake of the human sin, now the land is asking, what kind of divine justice is this? When the wicked can have such effects on the land and apparently get away with it, why should we suffer? The earth is asking. Why should we mourn? And now Jeremiah, uh, he's the same question. Jeremiah is suffering and mourning. The prophet is suffering and mourning. The land is suffering and mourning. It urges God to pull the wicked out of the circulation from among God's sheep violently. The earth is saying, why don't you remove these bad people from the earth? That is verse 3. Remove them from the land, not only for his sake, not only for the sake of Jeremiah, but for the sake of the land. Please remove these bad people. How long should the land mourn? We are waiting for a long time. How long should we wait? Only by removing the bad people, the land can be saved. The grass of every field withers. Animals and birds are swept away. The wickedness of those who live on the land, 12.4b. And so the land is drying up and it is devastated by foreign invasions and it is forsaken by God. It is now another big sin of the Israelites God has allowed the Babylonian army to enter into Israel and they are brutally manoeuvring the land. Have you seen an army destroying the land? Equally, the way they destroy the people, they will destroy the land. So now the land is shouting, what sin we made? We didn't do anything wrong. Why should the land be destroyed? Because of these bad people and beautiful in chapter 12, verse 8, God used a soft word for land. It is a gentle word. Uh, even they say it is a feminine word. Feminine means you have to treat very softly. That word is nahala. That is God's uh, gift. So it is God's heritage, 12.7 and 12.8. Uh, they lift up their voice against me. And God's house may refer to temple, land, or people, with beloved. That is coming here. And God's forsaking is comprehensive. Now God has left the temple. God has left the land. God has left his people. He has gone away. That is why Babylonians are massacring. And now you see that the temple in Jerusalem and the land are interrelated. It is God's dwelling place in the land. Blessings flow from the temple in the land. If God forsakes the temple, then the land does not have the capacity for blessing. And again, you know, in chapter 12, verse 10, God says, my vineyard, land, my Israel, my pleasant portion. And then it says, yeah, God delegates responsibility for the land to others. And uh, God does not intervene in small things. But God's lament begins with, 
what God has done with respect to the land. Jeremiah 12, 8 specifies a key factor in this divine move. Israel has become like a lion to God. A lion metaphor is like a foe, as an enemy. But in this text, Israel's persecution of the prophets. Israel has turned against God, against his prophets. And then God has become a victim. And in response, God is hating Israel. In as much as these animals of the land, to call the land as a victim. In Jeremiah, the animals bring resources to fight for the lands. Other praying animals have been used to speak. And here you see the wolf, leopard, snakes, it is all coming. And the list is expanded even to the use of EMA, the birds of prey. God calls all the wild elements to be instruments of his judgment, the hyena image. Then it has become food for such scavengers. The land which was such a beautiful land has only producing food for the hyena and eagles and vultures. God commands other animals to join in the devouring of Israel. What goes around comes around. The people have become lions to God. So God is inviting all the animals to devour the people. Israel's wickedness and neglect adversely affect the land and nature. And it brings invading armies. They have entered into land across every caravan route. No one is safe. God's land is not safe. Now the land is shouting to God. And God has chosen to relate the world through means that are available, only which are violent at the present time. This does not speak about divine anger, but this speaks about divine suffering. This speaks about the suffering of Jeremiah. This speaks about the suffering of the land. So in 36, all who devour you, God says, finally, now these uh, enemies, these animals, uh, these bad people, all those who devour you, those who plunder you shall be plundered. Those who devour you shall be devoured. All who pray on you, I will make a prey. Finally, God says, don't worry, and messianic time is coming, I will plunder those who plundered you. I will devour them who devoured you. I will prey on them who preyed on you. The land will become a land of peace. And the land will become my inheritance. And there will not be any judgment in future. And all the surrounding nations including Babylonia, all the people, they will come together and they will uh, worship God. And wolves and leopards will be playing with snakes. They will not hurt and destroy. God will finally give rest to the earth. So I think uh, we are uh, completing our uh, First section, and I am moving to the second section. Uh, yeah, this is Jeremiah 4. And Jeremiah 4 and Ezekiel will be very different from what we studied now. Uh, actually, in Jeremiah 4, the voice of the earth is retrieved. That is what we read in the earth reading of the Bible. 
Every time uh, we always speak in an anthropocentric way, human-centered way, we impose human thoughts on earth. We bring human ideas from the Bible. But now we are going to retrieve the voice of the earth in the Bible. You know, this is what the feminist interpreters did. For several centuries, we were reading Bible with the patriarchal eyes. So always the male language, the male culture, the male practices, we spoke on that. But now the women say, no, no, no. There are women in the Bible. And there are voices of the women in the Bible. That must be retrieved. And so they gave an immense contribution to biblical understanding. But here, yeah, we take the voice of the earth. This is a great contribution. They are also like us. Their voice is important in God's sight. So now in the fourth chapter, I will first introduce you some of the verses which speak about the earth, which speak about ground. Then you can relate with these verses. Uh, in verse 3, it says, Break up your fallow ground. Do not sow among thorns. It is, in this chapter, the prophet is speaking about fallow ground, about sowing and thorny ground. And then uh, in verse 6, it says, raise a standard towards Sion. Free for safety, safety. Do not delay, for I am bringing evil from the north. Sion is a city. It is land. It is earth. And God says, I am bringing evil from the north to destroy this city with a great destruction. And then seventh verse says, a lion has gone up from its thicket. A destroyer of nation has set out. Yeah. Uh, to make your land be a waste, your cities will be ruined without inhabitants. Now the earth is asking, what did we do? Why should they come and destroy us? Why should the land become waste? Why should our cities become ruined? Why we should become without inhabitants? This is the earth voice. This has to be retrieved now. And then it says, ah, he comes up like clouds. See, like clouds, like the whirlwind, far swifter than eagles. Oh, Jerusalem so that you can be saved. For your voice declares from Dan, it proclaims disaster from Mount Ephraim. Tell the nations, here they are. Proclaim against Jerusalem. Besagers are coming from a distant land. They shout against the cities of Judah. Your ways, your doings have brought this upon you. I am not doing. God is not doing. Your people, this is your doom. How bitter it is. It has reached your very heart. I looked on the earth, verse 20, 33, and it was waste and void. To the heavens, there was no light. I looked to the mount, they were quaking. The hills moved. I looked, 
there was no one. All the birds of the air has fled. I looked the fruitful land. It was a desert. All the cities were ruined. Thus saith the Lord, the whole land shall be desolation. I will not make a full end. Because of this the earth shall mount. Heavens will grow black. I have purposed. I have relented. I have heard a cry as of a woman in labor. Anguish as the one bring forth first child. The cry of Zion stretching out her hands. Oh, is me. Jerusalem is going to cry like a laboring woman delivering the first child. Nobody is saving. This is what is coming in chapter 4. Oh, this is terrible. Now we uh, want to see that uh, when earth responds, when earth speaks, how will it speak? So I will take uh, one by one. I think uh, we have to be a little cautious about time, but I will try to do as much as possible. Yeah. There is a powerful intimacy between God, the prophet, and the land. And this passage, it is full of an angry God. And the God is angry like an angry husband. And the land is like a battered wife who is suffering violence under the husband. The husband can have a hundred reasons to batter his wife, but the wife's voice is not coming out. Say the whole chapter of verse 4, God is speaking through the prophet how he's going to Yes, but uh, he's not uh, giving any reason. So interestingly, in this uh, essay, uh, the author is uh, angry with God. The author takes the voice of the earth. The earth is protesting against God. The earth is saying that God is not fair. God behaves like a violent man in a patriarchal society. How a man can beat his wife, a man can be brutal. That is the voice in the fourth. Uh, yeah, see, the term the Lord, the master, uh, it is a word which means possession. Literally, it means husband. And uh, yeah, the man divorces his sexually unfaithful partner Israel and marries his sister Judah, who also went and played harlot. That is what this passage says. God says, I married Israel, she was a harlot. I divorced her. Then I married Judah, she was also a harlot. Now Judah and Israel are asking, what language you are using against us? What uh, harsh uh, words you are using against us? They are unhappy with God. And then you see, yeah. The male perspective is the only acceptable view. The man is the judge. The man is the jury. The man is the prosecutor. The man is the executioner. That is what is happening with God. He is the judge. He is the jury. He is the prosecutor. He is the executioner. And the earth's voice is not heard. He does not allow the earth to speak. He does not allow the earth to give their reason. So now the nature is standing up against Yahweh. 
I am asking you, can you accept uh, such a reading? Can you accept a reading when the whole creation is standing in anger and protest against God for his language, for his uh, un, uh, unacceptable language? Actually, you read Jeremiah, full of uh, violence and sexy language. You read Ezekiel, harsh. And the next section is on Ezekiel 6 and the last two verses. Same like this section. Actually, this uh, section follows that uh, article. Ezekiel also, that is saying that earth is angry with Yahweh. Earth is fed up with Yahweh. Yet is unable to tolerate the language of Yahweh. Yet wants Yahweh to stop speaking. This is what is coming through these two sections. Now, but we have to you know, unpack these things. Uh, we have to resolve these things. Uh, we don't have to patronize God. We don't have to stand against the earth's uh, protest. We are all related to each other. We are all in relationship. All of us have strained relationship. So this is part of the strained relationship. The relationship has become completely upside down. We have to redeem the relationship. That means, have you seen sometimes in the family, the husband will shout, the wife will shout, the children will shout, the neighbor will think that this is the end of this family. And have you seen what is happening next morning? They will be hugging in the morning. They will say goodbye before he goes to office. They will say goodbye before the children goes. The neighbor is very disappointed. Oh, I never expected it will end like this. What is uh, happening? Night was different, morning is different. Same in Jeremiah, same in Ezekiel. This is a love fight. This is a fight for possession. This is father-children fight. And they want all the human beings to be redeemed. Ezekiel wants the entire creation to be redeemed. When we are redeemed, the happiness of the creation, the blessing of the creation will be redeemed. I just show you, you read the final chapter of Ezekiel. That is the scene about the temple. A river flows from the temple. There are trees on both sides of the temple. And there are fruits all the 12 months of the year. The leaves are healing for the people. God is in the temple. The whole humanity is coming to worship the Lord. It is a redeemed future. That is Ezekiel. So what you read in Ezekiel 6 in this chapter, I told you in the story what happened in the night. What you read in Jeremiah 4, that is a fight scene. But if you come to Jeremiah 31, 31 says, there is going to be a new covenant. God will make a covenant with all human beings, not Israel. And all the human beings will be turned to God. Nobody will have to preach the Bible. It will be inscribed in the hearts. People will behave good by instinct. They will love the animals. They will love the creation. That is the climax of Jeremiah. The temple in Ezekiel, that era of the Messiah, completely the reconciliation of whole creation. That is the climax of Ezekiel. Oh, you read Ezekiel 6, you read Jeremiah 4, you see the anger of uh, creation, 
you see the anger of uh, land, but finally the land becomes a blessing. God is dwelling in the land. Jerusalem becomes a blessed city. So this is how the whole thing will be transformed. But one thing I want to say uh, to conclude, uh, as uh, Professor uh, Matthew Koshi wants us, we should open up our new eyes. If there should be a new reading of the Bible. Reading the Bible with new perspectives. Sympathizing and in solidarity with the earth, with the land, with the nature, with the forest, with the animals and birds. Let us begin to read Bible new. This has vast potentials for transformation. Actually, it will change our human society, our relationship. Even God will be changed in this new hermeneutics. God loves this hermeneutics. So may God be praised. Once again, thank uh, Professor Matthew Koshi for this great opportunity to share God's word with you. I really do it with a lot of conviction, not merely as a tea class or as a teacher, but I speak from my heart. I have always been doing that. I hope you will be touched by these words. Uh, you will be uh, in are captivated by these methods and that you will all be led into a great future. May God help us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor.